Now, momentum operator <coughs> in position basis. Well, till now there we have been, uh, we have seen the position operator or its uh, functions in the position operator basis. Now what we are going to do next is momentum operator in the position basis. For this, I will use the translation operator, the translation operator for the infinitesimal case is defined as now I over h bar p dx, right? For the infinitesimal case, that's what we have seen. So p is the momentum operator now. And what was the definition, the, how the operation, translation operation is defined? It was defined as through this relationship so what do we do we just bring this in i over h bar p dx on x is that's infinitesimal x dx actually if it was finite when this was in the exponential form, this will still have the, the shift is this, if it is finite. However, the left-hand side, when it's infinitesimal, the left-hand side has this simple form. So what is the left-hand side? Left-hand side is x minus i over h bar dx, the momentum operator on the position operator eigenvector basis. Right hand side is, just let me expand, Taylor expand it, it and write it as x plus dxj dj x. Now, in, in compliance with that it is infinitesimal, so that I have used this ex expansion of the finite one as such, the right hand side I have retained only terms of the first order. The first terms go away and what do I have then? This is the dx j p j on x is 1 over i i h bar dx or dx j i h bar d j and x. The x j is an arbitrary infinitesimal increment. So then this gives us p j on x is i h bar d j and x. Notice that I have done it as I have resorted to the translation operator. I have done it for the three-dimensional case directly. The book goes through the one-dimensional case and then generalizes the three-dimension. But I could do it immediately if it is for, for any J index. So if I do it for one dimension, 1D case, P, x i h bar u by dx x. To be compared against the definition of these p's are the eigenvectors of the momentum operator with the eigenvalues. This is the, the same momentum operator now on the eigenvector position eigenvector basis acts like i h bar d by dx. Some of you may say, 
Don't we remember correctly that it was h bar over i or minus i h bar d by dx? Well, that, of course, is also true, but that is only on the wave functions. So let's proceed now. The trans the, it's a little slightly better, it's different than better than the, the treatment in the book. I wanted to use this argument directly because he has some uh, indirect argument, but uh, let me proceed now with, the, with this direct argument. Now, how is it? When I have psi 1 and p and psi 2, what is it now? Psi 1 and psi 2 are arbitrary vectors in this uh, vector space, Hilbert space. If I am going to refer to wave functions, wave functions in terms of the position operator eigenvector basis, that is psi of x, then I have to insert completeness sums in here. I'm doing it for the one dimensional case. I will, I, I know how to generalize it to the three dimensional one. So what is it? Psi one, P psi two, dx and dx prime, psi one and x and x and p and x prime, x prime and psi two. This is i h bar d by the x prime and x prime. X on the prime quantity. So I pull it out of this and write it as i h bar d by the x prime and x and x prime. And this is delta of x minus x prime. So this one is now d by dx prime. If you integrate, you just integration by parts, right? x prime integration can be carried out. Uh, setting x prime is equal to x, but as it involves an integration by parts, the sign changes. And so what was this? This was psi 1 star of x. This was psi 2 of x prime. So it becomes x prime goes to there. So dx psi 1 star of x minus i h bar d by the x prime of psi 2 of x. Do you get me? The signs are important in here. I will give an alternative complementary proof on the role of p operator on the eigenvectors and this coordinate functions. But here I hope you follow the signs carefully. Now d by the x prime, you integrate the x prime. Then integration by parts makes it a minus. It was this one. So you set x prime is equal to x. x. You recognize, right? P is the sandwich of minus i h bar d by dx between psi 1 and psi 2. If you take the expectation value, equating them, say dropping the indices psi 1 and psi 2, it is psi star and psi and minus i h bar d by dx. As compared to this one, compare against this. Now let me a complementary statement now. Complementary statement is the following. Now here is the psi. And it's expanded in terms of the coordinates. 
inserted the identity, write it as psi of x. It is indeed in the form of a vector sum basis and coordinates. Psi of x is the coordinate in the position eigenvector basis. So if I act by p, operator on psi, then I have dx p on x. Operators act on the state vectors of all sorts, right? Whether it's arbitrary or eigenvectors or whatever of psi of x. This one is ih bar d by dx x now. Then integrate by parts. I hope you find this second complementary argument useful. Again, when it is on the psi, it is minus i h bar d by dx, just because of the x and psi. It acts one way on this, one, one type of way, and as it involves an integration by parts, it acts with the other sign, minus i h bar, that is h bar over i. I hope you understand this difference well. It is an important difference. Okay. Now I will Go to momentum space wave functions. Now, till now, I have been using position operator eigenvectors as a basis to expand an arbitrary vector. Now, let's use the momentum space eigenvectors. They are also orthonormal and complete. That is dp, p, p, one identity operator. p, p prime is d, p minus p prime. Whatever you have done for x, you follow the same routine and do it for p. Hermitian operator and continuous. Spectrum is continuous, therefore it is this. So I have an arbitrary state. I insert here an identity. And here is the coordinate. Now new coordinates are psi of p. Well, usually in the books, instead of psi, when you go to the momentum space, that is just a convention of notation. When you go from the x, it is psi, in the momentum it's phi. Well, actually, I could have stick and I just say psi of p, psi of x. But anyway, whichever notation you're used to. So it is dp, p, phi of p. Well, actually, let me stick to my own notation. This label distinguishes that one is in the x space, the other is in the p space, okay? You may wish to understand the relationship these two sets of coordinates. How do we find the relationship between these? It's easy, really. There must be some transformation function because one is, it is in the x basis. This is in the p basis. And there must be a unitary transformation between these bases. 
and it is the, thus the coordinates are related through that transformation. A quick way of seeing that transformation is the following. I'll use this portion of the board. This corner may be a little difficult to see, perhaps. As we have played with those type of issues in, for the discrete spectrum nicely and easily, I will just repeat the pattern. Repeat whatever we have done for the discrete case. You'll see that things will be quite easy in this case as well. So what do I have? Let me write, take this expression for instance, or let me start with the x spaces, dx, x, sine of x. Let me project this along p. So p sine dx, p x, and sine of x. This is sine of p. How nice. It is this quantity which enters. Let me rewrite this. It is, it is nice. Psi of p is dx, p of x, psi of x. Something like this appearing, connecting the psi of x to psi of p. What is it? We'll see. It's very nice. Let me, although this is utterly pedantic, let me do it the other way around. Let me start with the psi written in the p basis. And project this along x. I'm just, the, here I started, this is the first argument. I started with the x expansion and project it along p, find the psi f, psi x, psi p connection. Now I start with the p expansion and project this along the x and find psi of x, dp, x of p, psi of p. This px here, or xp in here, are the crucial things which seem to be entering into the game. I have to find these two, determine. But obviously, this one, if you know this, the other, you know the other, and vice versa, because this is x and p of star. So it is the same thing. Whatever this thing is, x and p, the overlap of the P eigenvector and X eigenvector bases. There are two different bases, and you're interested in finding the overlaps, and that overlap play a role of connecting these two different wave functions. How do I get that? So my, my job is to determine this. It's not that difficult, because we have this beautiful tool under our control, right? to determine xp is my next job now. Let me take the eigenvalue equation and project this on x. Other, I can do that. That gives me something trivial. So, I will, I will uh, instead use the following. 
I'm trying to find some shortcuts, okay? P on X, which is IH bar dy dx and x. Let me start with this equation. The other equation I could have started, it wouldn't lead to much interest, in some, nothing new. There was nothing wrong with that, but this is something which contains some new information. Let me project this along the p eigenvector. So what is this? And it's beautiful now. P, capital P, x, I'm exaggerating the letters to Im indicate the difference between the eigenvalues and the operators. So it is IH bar P d by dx and x. Capital P is the only operator, the others are numbers, right? I pull this out because it doesn't jump over any other x function when I do that. So it is IH bar d by dx p and x. Well, now I use the eigenvalue equation. P is Hermitian, it acts at right and left the same. So it acts to the left and gives me again the PP. So the left hand side is PPX. Nice. Here is an equation which is a nice equation to solve, right? Notice that it was either x of p or p of x that I, I was supposed to be determining as p of x is the same as x of p star. Let me give this a name. I don't have to give this a name even. So what is the equation? The differential equation for this a beautiful entity is p over i h bar or minus i over h bar p, p of x. How do I integrate this? P of x is, say, called, let me give this a name, u of x, u p of x, if you want. I, want. I don't want to call it psi of p because it's going to be the complex conjugate of what I'm looking for. So it's much better I call it u p of x. So the solution is u p of x is, or much better, use the, retain the original name, p of x is e to the minus i over h bar p x Okay, just a simple differential equation which I sold. Uh, now, obviously, if I call this u of x indeed, it should contain a normalization, right? Eventually to, to have a physical meaning as a quantum mechanical function. So what is this really? If I now go to p x on p, which is more to the, let me consider now x on p, which is n. It is the complex conjugate of this p of x, so it is plus i over h bar p x. It is this expression and the complex conjugate of that u, which I found. Okay. up complex conjugate of x. What is the, does this have a meaning, this function? Notice that it is a function which connects, connects the eigenvector basis of position and momentum operator. It's a transformation, really. Beautiful transformation, but it has the following further property. It is eigenfunction of the momentum operator. Momentum operator on the functions was acting like minus ih bar d by dx, right? or h bar over i minus that. On the functions, on the basis vectors, it was a, a, a acting with a plus sign. On the functions, as I have demonstrated, it was acting like this. 
So if I take the momentum operator and act on up of x, then I will have i h bar over i d by dx on this quantity and i over h bar p of x, px. So h bar over i, i over h bar brings down a p, cancels, so I have p and e to the i over h bar px. Aha, uh -huh. this one is, it turned out that this function, which is star, No, it is this x of p. There, up, up star, indeed. This up star, particularly. It is an eigenfunction of the momentum operator. Funny enough, the connection transformation matrix between x and p eigenvector bases turned out to be an eigenfunction of the momentum operator. Okay. Nice. So then we have to normalize it, right? How do we normalize this? UP, well, it is UP star because I called UP, let me call this VP now with the plus sign. It's just name, X and P. This is UP star, VP is just X and P. It is this transformation matrix there. It was P and X, which is the complex conjugate of the other. It is the X, and X on P that I have determined. Perhaps it is this one that I have to write again. It is N e to the I over H bar PX. It is this thing which I determined. Forget the U's or VV's, et cetera. That's actually, it's a lengthy notation, but that's what it, what it, what it is. Uh, let me normalize this. Remember, the uh, normalization for the wave functions, that is psi on dx, x, and psi of x. If this is normalized, we have demonstrated that the coordinates are normalized in this manner, right? It is the state vectors in the Hilbert space. These are the coordinates, how they are normalized. So how this is normalized? n squared dx x px xp. Right, that's how I have written it. No, it's one, which is n squared. Ah, uh, this is dangerous. I shouldn't do it this way. I should do it in the following manner. P, P prime. They, because some of you are experienced that this is really plane wave, plane waves are uh, pathological. They are not normalized in the usual manner. They need to be normalized in this, in this, in this sense. Dx, x, x. So we have delta p minus p prime dx x p prime star. Sorry, x p star in the left, x p prime. Yes. Yes. Why did you write U P X uh, complex conjugate is equal to itself? Is there any no, I haven't written it as equal itself. I said let me call it a, this with a different notation. Forget it. This is this thing. Introducing a, the new notation confuses. I realize that. So forget it. I am talking about this quantity. So it is not equal to the complex conjugate of itself. I'm trying to normalize it. So what is it now? This one is here. Delta P minus P prime is N squared, right? I put that N. Dx e to the 
i over h bar p prime minus p and x, right? That's if I so you substitute these in here, that is the normalization condition you find. I need the one of the famous representations of the Dirac delta. This is the x over 2 pi h bar square root. No, just 2 pi h bar, sorry. h bar. i over h bar p minus p prime and x. This is the left hand side. That's one. Uh, one of the very uh, famous representations of the Dirac delta. You compare the left hand side with the right hand side, what you get? You get n squared up to a phase is 1 over 2 pi h bar, n is up to a phase 1 over 2 pi h bar. So that is the normalization. Normalization is the normalization of these eigenvectors of the momentum, eigenvectors, eigenvectors of the momentum. Therefore, this xp is finished now. xp is e to the i over h bar px divided by 2 pi h bar. Nice. Let me go back to those expressions that I have found. So what is the first? The first one is psi of p is dx p, px. px is the complex conjugate of the xp. So e to the minus i over h bar px divided by 2 pi h bar psi of x. Some of you say, ah, I recognize this. Of course you do. That's the Fourier transform in one dimension, right? The quantum mechanics, this Hilbert space algebra knows about the Fourier transform, funny enough. We, 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 we have not been talking about Fourier transform at all, but it turned out to be the case. And similarly, psi of x, if I write this line now, psi of x is the of the, there was a, again a typo, typo. Uh, I would like to request that you please change this, this, because p is to be carried down as p, not x, of course, right? So it is dp plus now i over h bar px 2 pi h bar psi of p. Isn't that nice? Of course, it's customary that you put those under the measures. And you have the, from x to p, you have the e to the minus factor. From p to x, e to the plus. This is the direct Fourier transform, and that's the inverse Fourier transform. It just turned out that the momentum functions in x and p spaces are Fourier transforms of each other. Okay. Now in the remaining few minutes, let me talk about an exercise. Well, generalization this to three dimensions is trivial, right? This was one dimensional, so let me do it for the three dimensions. 3D, psi of P is dx, d cube x, of course, this time, 2 pi h bar 3 halves. For each dimension is 2 pi h bar to the 1 half, so it is 3 halves. e to the minus i over h bar p dot x psi of x now. And inverse psi of x is d cube p 2 pi h bar 3 halves e to the plus i over h bar p dot x psi of p. If you want psi of p's, you replace by phi of p's as is, as is in the book, but this, there's no danger in here, so stick to it. 
because it is the same state, psi, projected on the x basis, I call it psi of x, projected on the p basis, I call it psi of p, instead of changing the name from psi to phi. It is artificial. Now, in the remaining 15 minutes, I will talk about a special, spe special class of wave functions. This is sort of a short exercise, so I don't have to really complete this. I will just use up the time and I'll uh, drop it whenever time ends. So, let me consider the following Gaussian, Gaussian wave functions. You'll see that Gaussian wave functions will have a nice feature. When I was uh, discussing at the end of the Heisenberg uncertainty theorem, I told you that there is a special class of states for which the equality sign holds. The equality sign holds when the, the delta x and delta p uncertainties acting on a given state if they are, they are acting on those gives you new states, delta x and delta p, if those two states are proportional, and furthermore, if the expectation value anti-commutator of delta x and delta p vanishes for that particular uh, class of states, then the delta a delta b is equal to one half expectation value of the commutator of a b. That's the minimum uncertainty. That's, it's not larger or equal, it's equal to it. And that class is called the minimum uncertainty states. You'll see that this state, the so-called Gaussian wave functions, are those states. And they have the minimum uncertainty product for them. Gaussian nature of it does it. You can solve those sophisticated equations and demonstrate that those states are indeed Gaussian. We do the opposite. We take Gaussian wave functions and we'll demonstrate that they indeed have minimum uncertainty product. The reverse, the, the direct version is more difficult to solve. This is, well, it's not that difficult. So let me copy the expression given to us by the book. Well, this is psi of x, one over, uh, I'll write it in the following manner. Uh, d pi d squared pi d squared to the minus 4 times e to the i k x minus x squared over 2 d squared. Notice that it also contains a parameter. If you want, some, sometimes if, you, if you're not af afraid that you are going to ruin the entire notation and make it very ugly, you can put that extra label D. That's a sort of a characteristic width of the Gaussian wave packet, right? So it is this expression. Uh, let's see what does uh, it mean. First of all, you can uh, mimic, well, no, let, you can check that it's normalized. I have put the normalization condition so that normalized, because we, that is dx psi k of x squared is 1, this overall things take his, takes care of everything. By the way, what is the mod square of it in itself? Psi k squared is this pi d squared minus a half times e to the minus x squared over d squared. This is 1 over square root of pi e to the minus x squared divided by d squared d. This profile is a rather interesting one. 
That's really the profile of a delta, really. Now you let D goes to zero. Let me try to plot this. You have to have a feeling about this profile. First of all, it is a Gaussian of this sort, right? What is the height? The height is when x is equal to zero, so it is one divided by one over pi and one over d. So this point is one over pi times d. So when d goes to zero, this goes all the way up, infinity. And what is this half width when the exponential goes to e to the minus one, one over e, for instance. They go, when you are dealing with the exponentials, you go to the e to the minus one. So when x squared is at the order of d, it is the maximum one over e of the entire thing. So what is this width? This is twice d. Because x squared d squared gives you just e to the minus one for that first factor, so it is, it, it, uh, one third of the maximum. So when d goes to zero, this becomes narrow, it becomes high, so that really mimics a delta function. And infinitely high and infinitely narrow. So this Gaussian wave function has quite an interesting property. But otherwise, for an arbitrary d, it has this shape, this profile. Uh, a 2d width and 1 over d of course, 1 over square root of pi is at the order of 1, 1 over d height. Okay, good. So we can think of, uh, as we have sort of understood, you, I invite you to check that that normalization condition is satisfied. It's not too difficult an integral to carry out. Perhaps I should teach you a little trick in the usual Gaussian integration trick. Uh, I want all of you to have it on, on your control. You can look at the Google or tables, etc. But it's, it's so easy. Sometimes it's you can do it in shorter time than than searching the Google. So the Gaussian integral. That is, for example, the, this is a generic integral, dx e to the say beta x squared from minus infinity to plus infinity. The simplest of the Gaussian integrals. This is pi over beta. Can you demonstrate this? Well, it's not too difficult to keep in your mind. Particularly, this will be relevant when we will be discussing, when we will be handling the path integrals. They are so important integrals. And can you really do this easily? You can do it easily, like this. You take the square of this integral. You multiply the integral with itself. It's a dummy summation variable like ij summed over. So you just take dx e to the b x squared dy integral dy e to the b y squared, right? Dummy, dummy variables you cannot repeat. It's already repeated, right, summation. So then you combine these two, write it in dx and dy. The limits are minus infinity to plus infinity here and here there as well. So e to the minus b x squared and y squared. And you go to the polar, the, the plane, and here is the e, x and y. This is the theta and this is the r. So x equals r cos theta, y equals r sine theta. And the measure the x dy is r theta, right? R sine theta. How is the Jacobian? dx dr is cos theta, dx dy d theta is r sine theta, r sine theta d theta. Huh? Or r theta. r squared sine theta d phi. r? Beautiful, thank you very much. That is the one, right? Okay, great. So i squared is d theta 
0 to 2 pi now, it is the roll of 5, right? Indeed so. It is r dr, dr r rather, Z, 0 to infinity, that's half line. And here is minus b r squared. Good. This portion of the integral gives you 2 pi, and this portion of integral, if we define r squared as u, u, so du is twice r dr r, so it is du divided by 2, again 0 to infinity, e to the minus bu. Truths cancel and you have a pi in here. And what is this integral? Minus 1 over u, determine at infinity and 0. At infinity is 0. At infinity is 0. e to the minus beta u divided by, there is a minus sign in here, a beta, sorry. At infinity and 0. At infinity it is 0. At 0 it is minus 1, so pi over beta. So integral squared is, a, as I promised, is pi over beta. Integral is pi, square root of pi over beta. This is a very famous integral. I really request that you should all master the technique. You see, there is not much to it. The only problem is perhaps the Jacobian. And probably at freshman calculus, you have to compute those Jacobians properly. OK, this Jacobian should be the only crucial thing which may be a little, you know, requires a little memory. So this is the integral. So you'll use that integral in carrying out the normalization. That's the point I, I, I wanted to mention. Fine. So what I will do next? Let me summarize, because this was more or less necessary that I have spent a few minutes on it. For example, we can think of taking this Gaussian Bay function, and in this Gaussian Bay function, we can compute this. That's the first thing, and then we will compute dp squared expectation value, which is p squared minus p expectation minus squared. And then we will demonstrate that perhaps you should do it till next week so that we can really discuss for a few minutes and move over to something new. The Gaussian nature is very important and the uncertainty product comes out to be just a minimum value. These happen to be the coherent states. Coherent states are very important in quantum optics and co coherent states are really Gaussian. They are the eigen states of the e to the a lambda a dagger operator on the vacuum, right? So uh, that they have the minimum uncertainty is quite important. So you should have a very strong feeling Take it as an exercise and try to finish it by next week. Okay, so it is all for today.